good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue, I want to welcome you to our fireside chat here at the Kroc Leadership Center on campus here at Purdue. And then I also want to say hello to everyone who's joining us online. We have hundreds of people joining us online from all over the world. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue is the world's preeminent trusted tech accelerator. Our mission is to advance freedom by building the global trusted tech network of governments, companies, organizations, and individuals to accelerate the innovation and the adoption of trusted tech in order to secure freedom. In fact, our North Star at the Institute is this guiding principle that technology must advance freedom. It's a very simple concept, but it's not an easy one. And whether it's artificial intelligence, quantum computing, 5G, semiconductors, or hypersonics, authoritarian regimes have set their sights on weaponizing and dominating technology in order to export their way of life. Securing freedom requires that we bring, we bring together in new ways, high-tech, private sector know-how, technology expertise, such as the leading STEM students and researchers here at Purdue, or at NYCU in Taipei, and foreign policy and national security expertise from among our like-minded partners and allies. That integrated expertise, that partnership among public and private, among partners and allies is required to secure freedom and secure high tech. So we are fortunate to have with us today three transformational leaders who exemplify this very partnership and leadership and who are building upon the, upon the long history that Taiwan and Purdue University have enjoyed for more than 70 years. We look forward to memorializing this growing partnership later today through two new agreements between Purdue and NYCU and the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy and National Chengchi University. So without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panel. Ambassador B. Kim Shao has served as Taiwan's representative to the U.S. since 2020 after serving as a senior advisor to the president at the National Security Council of Taiwan. Ambassador Shao previously served four terms in the Taiwan legislature, including as ranking member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee and chair of the USA Caucus in the Legislative Yuan. Born in Kobe, Japan, Ambassador Shao grew up in Tainan and has an MA in political science from Columbia University and a BA in East Asian Studies from Oberlin College, Ohio, which I Google mapped and is only five hours, uh, five hour drive <laughs> away from here. So very close. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Chi Hung Lin serves as the president of National Yangming Chao Tung University, or NYCU, in Taipei, a leading research university which is creating a generation that will develop and further Taiwan's emerging smart medical industry. For over 20 years, Dr. Lin has worked at the intersection of scientific discovery and international relations at NYCU and in the Taipei city government, where he was commissioner in the Department of Health. He earlier served at NYCU as Dean of the Office of International Affairs, Vice Dean of Research and Development, and Director of the Institute of Microbiology and Immunology. He received his doctorate in biology from Yale University. Finally, the Honorable Keith Kroc is our co-founder and chairman of the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue. Previously, he served as the Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, where he led the development of the Global Economic Security Strategy built the Clean Network Alliance of Democracies to defeat the CCP's master plan to control 5G, and spearheaded the largest onshoring in US history to secure the semiconductor supply chain. He also strengthened ties with Taiwan by orchestrating the Lee Economic Prosperity Partnership Agreement and becoming the highest ranking State Department official to visit in 41 years. Keith previously served as chairman and CEO of DocuSign, was co-founder of Ariba, former chairman of the Purdue Board of Trustees, where he earned a degree in engineering and also an MBA from Harvard Business School. So please join me in welcoming our esteemed panel. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Keith. Well, first of all, thanks all of you for coming. I think you're in for a special treat with our friends from uh, Taiwan. Um, it was one of the great honors of my life uh, to be the highest ranking State Department official to go to Taiwan in 41 years. I was greeted with 40 fighters and bombers from the Chinese Communist Party, but with open arms from the great people of Taiwan. So let me, you know, let me just first of all welcome you guys 
to the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue. Um, and we really appreciate you coming. You know, at the Institute, our North Star is technology must advance freedom, as Michelle was talking about. And when I look at Taiwan, it is a linchpin of democracy. It's a role model uh, for freedom. So what I'd love to kick it off, and Dr. Lin, we'll have you go first. This is a question for both of you. And that's this, in your own words, mm -hmm. why is it so important that the United States and its citizens support Taiwan? Okay, so uh, it's the uh, third visit to the Midwest and to Purdue, actually, in the past two months. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, I enjoy coming here a lot. Uh, so I think Taiwan, uh, we, it is a, uh, a country uh, with little natural resources, not much, and only human. So the human resources are the, uh, the major uh, you know, things we have. So in the, uh, also in our culture, uh, we cultivate uh, the young kids, send them to the uh, school and hope that uh, they can develop their own career. So in the past, uh, lots of them sent to the United States. I am one example of that. Uh, so at that time, uh, we learn and we uh, also uh, receive help from our friends uh, in the United States a lot. And uh, so we learned the system, we learned the science and technology, and we, try, we came, came back home and tried to root it, what we learned uh, in the island. And uh, so it seems like we share the same value, okay? Uh, not only that, we also come from a Chinese culture as an origin. So this is a very good combination of the East and West. And uh, so as Keith just said, we represent the uh, new phase of uh, you know, cultural uh, uh, integration. And this is a new ways of uh, democracy, I should say that. So we receive a lot of help. And now I think it's the, 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 the moment that we want to give back we can help in certain ways using the, uh, uh, the technology uh, that we develop uh, thanks to all the friends who help us. So I think this is the, uh, you know, uh, the, the main thing uh, in the past uh, uh, six months. Uh, the NYCU has been engaged with Purdue and we share some value and we also exchange our knowledge and uh, we look for a brighter, collaborated future. Thank you. Well, that, I mean, that is great. And um, we're so excited about that partnership, uh, Dr. Lin. You've been here so many times, we should, we should give you an, a, deg a degree. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, my sweet mate, my freshman year, Kerry Quad, uh, he came from Taiwan. He'd never been to the US before. We taught him everything we know. Now, I don't know what he's doing now, but you know, that exchange of culture is really important. Ambassador, tell us in your own words. Well, um, you know, thanks for the question, but I, I first want to start out by also thanking you and um, also Purdue University for arranging this opportunity to be here. And as uh, we were driving uh, onto the campus, I mean, it's a huge and beautiful campus, but, um, you know, I, as just introduced, I, I studied, went to college, and. Uh, Indiana's neighboring state uh, in Ohio, and the scenery of cornfields and um, <laughs> flatland, you know, felt very familiar. But I think, you know, most importantly, you know, again, being on a university college campus where there's just so much energy and um, many Taiwanese people, like Dr. Lin described, are beneficiaries of quality American education, and Purdue has indeed produced um, many uh, important uh, leaders in uh, all areas of, of Taiwan society. And uh, we 
uh, look forward to this continuing partnership. But um, you know, coming back to addressing your question, you know, why 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 this partnership between the U.S. and Taiwan is is so important, and of course, education is is one of those uh, areas that has increasingly also become an important component of. Of, of our work, uh, not only in Washington, but our office here in Chicago. And I'd like to recognize uh, Johnson, who, who um, heads our, the Taiwan sh office in Chicago, also in your neighborhood um, here in the Midwest. But we, um, you know, you, you just laid it out, you know, your, your North Star, um, the values of freedom and technology. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the Taiwan-U.S. partnership is built on our shared values, our shared interests. And um, why Taiwan is important to the United States or why the United States is important for Taiwan is because we have these shared values and interests. Um, you know, Taiwan's freedom didn't come about easily. You know, it, it was, you know, it, it took decades of, of efforts, you know, of fight and struggle to bring about the basic freedom so that um, many Americans take for granted, but for us, it's just a recent history. And we only had, for the first time in our history, the first presidential elections in 1996. So we are a very young democracy. Uh, for us, democracy and freedom, um, you know, didn't fall from the sky. You know, they came as a result of, of demands, you know, fights, struggles. Some people paid the price of going to jail or even their lives, but, you know, we indeed cherish what we have today. And I think it's a way of life that's important for not only the people of Taiwan, but for many around the world. And we are on the front line in defending our democracy. And, and so I think, um, you know, being on the front line, the survival of Taiwan's democracy is important, not only for the people of Taiwan, uh, but for everyone who would also um, enjoy opportunities in a free society. Um, and technology, of course, and I just highlighted the contributions of the U.S. educational system and, and decades of uh, educational cooperation between our societies. Um, and Taiwan has taken advantage of that um, in a positive way, in a way that also advances freedom as well as human progress. And we have contributed to um, stable, trusted, and secure supply chains in a global way, um, and also in a way that's been very complementary to the strengths of the United States. Taiwan's strengths, um, as demonstrated, have been um, clearly highlighted in the area of manufacturing, especially in technology, while um, that complemented with the United States, your innovation, research in software, uh, in design, uh, make us force multipliers. And uh, so this partnership, I think, is also important as we, you know, back to your, your motto, um, technology um, and advancing freedom. We, um, I think these are certain core interests so that will continue to bind our societies together. Thank you, Mr. Master. You, you know, can you imagine the threat that Taiwan citizens live under every day? Because for uh, the PRC, and for General Secretary Xi, what Taiwan represents is it misspells his myth that the Chinese culture cannot live in a democracy. That's why he wants to take it away. He's also obsessed with semiconductors. Well, uh, let's talk about semiconductors for a second, Dr. Lin. You know, here at Purdue, we're called the boiler makers. But now these days, it's the chip makers. <laughs> it, 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 we're all sort of cradle of astronauts and uh, cradle of quarterbacks, uh, but we can come back to that later on. Huh? Uh, um, and so if you look at this partnership that we're forming in, in this whole area of uh, semiconductor manufacturing, uh, this is the base of, of every industry. Tell us a little bit. Um, about the partnership, why, and also why is this industry so important? And tell us about the amazing capabilities of uh, TSMC and the other chip makers there. You know, that was uh, one of our missions was to onshore TSMC. That was the largest onshore in history, $12 billion. There was not one uh, semiconductor company in 2020 that was gonna build anything in the United States. We tried Intel, Samsung, everything. And we knew if we could get TSMC, we could use it as a catalyst to get the others. Since that time, since that onshoring in May 15, 2020, $350 billion of investment from chip makers 
and, uh, and jobs in the United States since that time. And that was also obviously the, cat, the catalyst we used to architect the Chips and Science Act. Um, and Taiwan had such a big part of that. So tell us about the capabilities and the importance. Well, it's uh, very interesting that uh, uh, in 1960s, uh, when the two major universities reestablished from mainland China to, uh, to Taiwan, actually to the Xinchu, uh, right next to the Xinchu Science Park. So uh, the government uh, had the university to choose uh, from nucleus or electron. And luckily, uh, Tsinghua chose the uh, nucleus. So they had the uh, first uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, whereas, uh, we got nothing to choose from, so except for electron. So we choose ele electron. So that's the beginning of the uh, electronics in uh, initially a national Chaotong University and now uh, NYCU. So that's the beginning. Uh, through the uh, efforts from all the uh, predecessors, uh, we built gradually in, I think, I remember in 1974, the first transistors uh, in Taiwan, okay? And later, uh, they put all the efforts in. So I think it suffice to say that the uh, NCTU is the uh, cradle of Taiwan's microelectronics and uh, semiconductor industry. This uh, recent poll shows that the uh, uh, founder or uh, current uh, CEO, top executive of the uh, major company in Xinchu Science Park, are uh, alumni of uh, NCTU or NYCU, 65% of them. So that says that you know, we are really involved uh, in uh, this industry, in this area. And the reason, uh, you may heard that uh, one of the uh, magic things that happened in Shinju Science Park is that they form clusters. Because in this industry, you need to have a vertical uh, 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 qualification. So uh, because of the close relationship with all these uh, alumni, so naturally they form this industry and continue until now. Uh, there's also a recent poll in TSMC that two-thirds of their top administrative are actually uh, related to uh, NYCU one way or another. So we all come as a family, work together, okay? So, uh, so I think back to your question, uh, this thing don't come easy. So this clustering effect is not easily to be copied in other places mm -hmm. of the world, okay? So deep rooted to this success, I think is the uh, young Taylor, the continual human resources to inject uh, into this area. So in the uh, past, I say past year, I've been working with uh, Mark, uh, Professor Longstrom, as well as many colleagues in the uh, Purdue University. We realized that the uh, most important things for this industry, for this business, is the uh, talents, especially young talents, who are willing to really look into this area, dig into it, and do researches, and then relentlessly uh, to let the, uh, the business and operation going uh, in the plant and in the foundry. So this is uh, what we've been working. And uh, so work together uh, with Badu, I realized that uh, you know, we don't want to duplicate things. We want to be complementary uh, to our partners. And this is happening right now. So currently, uh, through the uh, exchange student, through the uh, dual degree program, and we co-develop online courses for you know, the, the related uh, disciplines. I think we are moving toward that way. So later today, we, uh, we have MOU already, and we're gonna put on some uh, very uh, substantial agreements based on what we have and look forward. I think co-creation uh, is the key words for the future. 
for the next phase of the uh, semiconductor and uh, microelectronics uh, industry. Absolutely, and, and it's really amazing what uh, Taiwan's been able to do, and this partnership as well. And we know the General Secretary, she is absolutely obsessed with owning the semiconductor business. That's also uh, a big, big threat. Um, and we also know there's uh, power in unity and solidarity. Uh, and so, Ambassador, you, uh, you know, when, when I was running U.S. economic diplomacy, we worked closely. We had a, a five-pronged strategy to, um, to enhance the prosperity of Taiwan, to strengthen their sovereignty, and also to heighten international standing. And that's when we put together the science and tech back and the uh, prosperity partnership, onshoring the visit, and also the Clean Network Alliance of Democracies. And this was designed to really have that power through unity and solidarity and represent a security blanket. And Taiwan uh, was one of the first nations that came on that uh, network. And so um, let me ask you this, uh, Ambassador. Um, you know, in, in, in your own words, when you look at that uh, kind of diplomacy and, and when you look at protecting uh, that sovereignty, how, how important is a coalition of allies to Taiwan? You know, we also spend a lot of time uh, with the countries that rec still recognize Taiwan. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Well, um, you know, uh, again, your um, the institute that you've supported in tech and diplomacy that kind of embodies again this uh, spirit of um, you know the need to advance technology or our goals in technology through diplomacy. And what diplomacy is, you know, working across nations, across borders, across peoples, across cultures, across societies to resolve shared challenges but also to advance shared interests. And um, what we have ahead of us is uh, the need to um, be innovative in finding those tools uh, that improve our lives uh, as societies, but also as humanity. And um, you know, Taiwan has sought to be a force for good, uh, contributing uh, to progress, um, not only in our society, but on a global level. And therefore, in this process, uh, we have sought to uh, achieve more international connections uh, internationally. And um, you, you, you just highlighted some of the projects that you helped to spearhead uh, when you were at the State Department, and I want to thank you for that. Um, when you live and work in Washington, you realize that there are not a lot of issues that have such a degree of bipartisan unity and agreement, and Taiwan is one of them. Um, and the word continuity is rarely used across different political administrations um, in very competitive political settings. But um, the projects that you initiated, including the economic prosperity partnership dialogue between the U.S. and Taiwan, um, the science and technology agreement that was actually signed by President Meng, uh, Jiang Meng of uh, Purdue University, uh, while he was also affiliated uh, with the State Department, um, is starting to produce dividends for both our societies. But I think what Taiwan's interested in, of course, in addition to being force multipliers through working with the United States and advancing uh, technology that also advances freedom and you know, human progress, but also in expanding those links and connections internationally. I mean, we face it, you know, everything, we do everything around us including, and I'm not exaggerating by saying the air we breathe, the quality of the air we breathe, has something to do with technology. And, you know, and, 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 and given the prevalent role of technology in our lives, um, you know, the, the focus that we have, you know, the investments uh, in, in, in this is, is just so incredibly important. Um, you mentioned our partnerships internationally, and I must admit that it continues to be a challenge um, as, you know, our, our diplomatic space is, is isolated, it's constricted, uh, restricted, um, and, you know, we, um, as a result, though, I think it's made us more resilient as Taiwanese people. Um, you know, like the American people, uh, you know, we are very di diligent, uh, hardworking, we're very pragmatic, 
Um, but I, I think for us, the added dimension of very difficult international circumstances uh, means that we have to be extra innovative uh, in overcoming those challenges and overwhelming difficulties. And uh, so, um, you know, these partnerships we formed with the United States, we certainly hope to extend those uh, into like-minded uh, societies and countries. And um, I think we're in a very important moment of transition where you know, everything from communications technologies, um, they need to be trusted. Um, supply chains have to be reliable. And you know, we've all been through a very difficult period of, of COVID. You know, the future of, of global health, uh, dealing with shared challenges to humanity, um, you know, epidemics, you know, climate, you know, it, everything requires techno technological uh, innovation and solutions. And I think that's where being like-minded, uh, you know, sharing the values and goals that we have uh, becomes so important. And um, so, you know, we will continue to work with uh, like-minded friends and democracies and partners uh, who are open uh, to working with us. And I think the irony is that, um, you know, all the pressures on, and, and threats on, on Taiwan these days are generating more attention and more interest internationally in finding opportunities uh, to work with us. And um, the realities that, uh, or the fact that we are a, a globally connected society means that any contingency, um, any security contingency related to Taiwan will have significant global impact uh, that will affect everyone in this room and around the world. Um, and so we all have a stake in uh, ensuring the stability of the region, the peace of the region, um, and ensuring that freedom and democracy continues uh, to be that cherished value that, that also serves um, to create the environment that allows creativity and innovation. Uh, I think that's, that's driving a lot of the research here at Purdue, a lot of the work that Dr. Lin and his colleagues uh, do uh, in, in Taiwan uh, and in our academic settings. So this is exactly the reason why we're so excited uh, to have a Taiwan Center here at the Kroc Institute for Tech Diplomacy to really help in terms of building that international standing and building uh, that network. And that is so uh, critical in everything that we do. And that relationship is built on uh, one word, which I think is the most important word in any language, and that's trust, right? I, I, I used to stand up in front of our DocuSign, you know, all our DocuSign employers and say, we're not in the software business, we're in a trust business. We deal with people's most important documents, the one you sign, because it is the most important. You buy from people you trust, you partner with people you trust, you love people you trust. Uh, and nobody trusts your neighbor, the PRC. But the relationship between United States and Taiwan, that is built on trust, and that is the most important word. And so Dr. Lin, talk to us about that concept of trust and how that relates uh, to technology and, and, and also how, you know, how you get that across to your students as well. <laughs> Especially nowadays you have uh, chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Mo gave his graduation speech on Chat GPT. <laughs> he tried plugging it in; it didn't work, so he actually had to write it himself. Well, uh, let me put it this way: I take uh, TSMC, that everybody knows about the company, as an example. Uh, the success of TSMC nowadays uh, rely, I think, uh, most of you, if you are from the business side, you will say, "Well, they are." Uh, invest a lot of money uh, to really upgrade their capital equipment. At the time that uh, you know, all the uh, financial analysis say, well, this is probably not a good move. But that's the critical point that uh, he exceeded his uh, rival and competitor. So that's one thing. Another equally important thing is what you said, the trust. TSMC earned the trust from its customers, okay? So by keeping the uh, commercial secret really constrained and re you know, not leaking out. So if you ever been visit uh, to TSMC, you know how the uh, security measure are being conducted in that company, okay? 
So that will let the customers, even though uh, most of their customers are rival, they are competing uh, each other, but they are all willing and feel safe to have their chip design be manufactured in TSMC. So this is uh, a, a really important things that uh, you know trust can be a really uh, high level things, but it can also you know down to the earth to the uh, the success of a company. Okay. Now uh, talking about the uh, Chat GPT, uh, it's now uh, been an issue in the uh, higher education arena. Uh, so how to, you know, let your student, uh, they want to advance along with the, uh, the progress of the technology. I never uh, set any rule to restrict the use of new technology. But you have to let the student, student know how to properly use this technology. Okay, so properly cite it is one important thing. And there's another major issue uh, we want to uh, solve is the uh, intellectual property. So uh, any product generated from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the open AI, so the copyright belongs to which party. This is something that uh, we need to solve in the near future. But other than that, I think, you know, just open to embrace and to engage mm -hmm. with the, uh, the new technology, and we'll find a way to gain the trust. Yeah. You know, speaking at TSMC, uh, there was a two-week time period uh, when we were uh, convincing TSMC to onshore. And so with Chairman Mark Liu, uh, he really trusted in us. You know, uh, we had to make up a, a a pricing differential, you know, mm. and I said, uh, look, we want you to come. I said, you're going to have to trust us. Uh, and I go, it's literally going to take an act of Congress. And he opened his, his, his books to us and, uh, and we trusted him and, and we made it happen. Um, and that's just such a great example, I think, of that, of that trust. When we talk about, uh, uh, Ambassador, you know, this, this, these trust principles, the trust doctrine, these values that we share, things like accountability, integrity, reciprocity, transparency, respect for rule of law, respect for uh, property, respect for sovereignty of nations, respect for the environment, respect for human rights. These are the values that we honor in the free world, and authoritarian regimes do not. As a matter of fact, they use it against us. Uh, for their strategic advantage. So what the trust doctor did is it flipped all that right on its head in the jujitsu move. And we actually weaponized the very principles that protect our freedoms and maintain the moral high road. And this is one of the things that we're um, engaged with with the Kroc Institute leading the Global Tech Security Commission, which is an international commission uh, comprised of 15 countries and Taiwan's one of those with uh, their member is the Minister of Technology, Audrey Tang. And um, this is an important, you know, this is an important effort uh, that we have going on. So uh, here's a question I have for you, um, Sebastian, is, um, so we just hosted Deputy Secretary General uh, Mercia Giovanna of NATO. Um, he's going to be, uh, we'll, we'll be having a, a big NATO center here at the Kroc Institute. And he was the first guy I saw when building the clean network. He said, hey, look, we need a clean NATO network. We can't, you know, we need these things in peacetime or wartime. We can't uh, uh, have some countries that are, have trusted networks, some that don't. Um, how important is, is NATO uh, in terms of your security? You know, if you looked at what we are trying to do here at the Croc Center, is bring the Pacific and the Atlantic together. And tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that, because also one of the things he said when I, and I hosted him out at my home in San Francisco for dinner with about 30 CEOs. He said, look, we always focus political and militarily. Now we're also going to focus more on the economic piece and also more on the Pacific. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. Um, 
NATO and our security. Well, let me put it this way. Um, you know, there, we, we look at our security in a comprehensive way. Um, there's the military defense security piece. There's economic security piece. There's social security. There's um, the resilience of our democracy. And um, I, I think on the first piece on, you know, the defense military aspects, um, you know, we've had, you know, less of a connection directly uh, to NATO. And we strongly believe uh, first and foremost is uh, Taiwan's, the willingness of the people of Taiwan to defend ourselves and our own investments uh, in our defense. So we must um, demonstrate that willingness before we can go out asking for help from others. But um, I think the second layer of a deterrence, because ultimately defense is to prevent security contingencies from happening. It's to deter a conflict from happening. Um, and the first layer of deterrence is our own um, security. Second layer uh, involves the support of our close allies and partners, um, including the United States through the framework of the Taiwan Relations Act. But I think there's a third level, and that is a consistency of international messaging and support. Um, I, I think it's no secret that you know, a tragedy in any part of the world, war or conflict, has consequences for all of us. And, um, and you know, therefore, we all have a vested interest. You know, whether it's NATO, whether it's our, within, in our immediate neighborhood, um, you know, Japan, the Philippines, uh, Australia, and others, we all have a vested interest in the continuing peace and stability of the region. And uh, NATO in particular, I think, um, is uh, made up of uh, multiple democracies uh, who also have a lot of uh, uh, innovation, uh, creativity, ingenuity, and modern technologies um, that advance some of our shared interests. And, and so I think uh, we'd um, you know, be, be open to working with um, um, states, but also um, you know, partners um, in the NATO context on advancing certain technologies and, and sharing uh, information uh, in that sense, in um, dealing with the multiple challenges uh, that, that contributes to our comprehensive security that includes um, economic security. Um, you just mentioned um, you know, clean networks, and I want to say something about that. You know, I think you know, it's been broadly discussed you know, that we need trusted networks, that we need you know, 5G systems or satellite comm systems uh, that are uncompromised, un, unintruded um, by um, authoritarian states and, and um, that are fully reliable. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, beyond that, you know, the, the kind of the, that, that trusted aspect is, is certainly critical, but, but it also has to be, from a practical standpoint, a successful business model for it to work. Um, you know, ultimately, um, when we're competing, whether we're competing against Huawei or other um, technologies um, that that we where trust is a concern, um, you know, it's critically important that we create business models that are economically efficient and competitive, and and that's where the partnership between Taiwan and the United States comes in. Um, and that's the, about that's why the ecosystem that Dr. Lin just mentioned um, has been Taiwan's core competitive advantage. We have an ecosystem of of talent, of suppliers, of you know an, an ecosystem of hundreds of companies that contribute to um, the supply chain uh, for the chip industry. And in the same way, you know, we need to build a trusted ecosystem that contributes to communications technologies and other industries, biohealth and, and other sectors. And, and building that does certainly require you know, expanding. Um, you know, there are virtual ecosystems, there are also physical ecosystems. And, and I think when we're looking at tech and diplomacy, we're looking for partners internationally. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where NATO comes in too. Um, partners internationally mm -hmm. to contribute to a trusted network and putting our you know, comparative and competitive advantages together um, to make our trusted networks also um, you know, business profitable networks and workable networks, affordable networks um, that can go beyond um, the borders of our own um, democracies, but you know, cover uh, uh, a broader base in the context of global competition. I think you're absolutely right. You know, in terms of combining those ecosystems into a network, and you know, 
the, fa uh, the fastest way to build a network is a net network of networks, right? And that's what we did with the clean network. First we got NATO, then the EU, then the Quad, the Three Cs initiative. And that's what we want to do. And so bringing these ecosystems together. So bringing the Purdue ecosystem and the Crock Institute ecosystem with, with <laughs> Taiwan, with the university, that's what, that's what the center is going to be all about. Uh, so, Michelle, I think we're going to get some questions. That's a yes. good place to land it. Yeah. Are we going to get some questions we from We are, yeah. So, so thank you, Keith. Thank okay. you, Ambassador. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Um, and I'll just pick up, Ambassador, on one of the remarks that you made, which is Taiwan's freedom didn't come free, and that it's a continuous fight and a continuous struggle. And I think a good reminder for all of us, and our collective freedom is also not going to be free, and we're going to have to fight for it every day. Um, so now we've got about, I think, 10 or 15 minutes of questions from our audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We've got team members who will bring a microphone over to you. So who's got a first question here? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, my name is Heather Fabrias. I work in the Office of Professional Programs um, in the College of Engineering. And I'm actually leaving for Taiwan tomorrow uh, with a group yes. of uh, 23 students, I believe. Um, and they are first year engineering students who are coming. So they've actually just graduated from high school and we're going to be um, visiting NYCU. And um, I just drew a blank. TS TSMC, <laughs> too many acronyms. Um, and so um, my uh, question to you based on the, the topic today um, is as we're bringing our, our students to meet your students and visit uh, Taiwan and learn about the country, the culture and so on, what is your hope that these um, fledgling uh, college students will come back with so that throughout their college career, they're thinking about Taiwan and what they want, how they want to interact, and what is your hopes that they'll they'll get out of it, and your students at NYCU as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm going back home tomorrow, so maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll maybe see you on the same flight. Taiwan. Uh, yes, uh, welcome. Uh, this is uh, the the the. The exchange, student exchange, I, I refer to, uh, this is part of our agreement. First of all, to understand each other, especially uh, uh, at the, the college level. Uh, the students, if you see how they interact with each other, it's amazing. I mean, they kind of uh, get acquainted to each other so fast. And, uh, and that they will keep in mind. For example, kids remember his... Uh, Roommates, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, maybe only 20 years ago. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 15. <laughs> so uh, I really want uh, the visiting student, if they are interested in semiconductor, come see it. How that cluster effect is taking place in the small university town called Xinzhu. Mm -hmm. This is a city of uh, 400,000, mm -hmm. okay? How that make into a university town, mm -hmm. okay? And realize that it takes uh, a lot of efforts to really group something into what we call a ecosystem. Mm -hmm. People come in, co-create, okay? And then uh, when they come back, they somehow got interested in Mark Longstrom's program on semiconductor because I understand that here in the States, uh, young kids are shy away from going into clean room uh, to do the, uh, the, the foundry. Those are, you know, uh, really hardworking uh, job. So uh, I do not know if or not they were convinced that they want to do this, but they can go there and see it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, exchange program we are talking about also uh, provide opportunity for the young kids here, the states, to really have the hands-on ex experiences to really do experiments. So the semiconductor will be something of a fantasy. This is something real, okay? Now, for the kids from NYCU, we encourage them to come here first to really appreciate uh, what the US as a great country, 
not only in the area, but also in the diversity and how uh, people are really, you know, see things through different angles and different perspectives and people are res respect to uh, other people's uh, points of view. I think that's very important because in Taiwan, this is a relatively small island and uh, the vision tends to be more narrow. Okay, so I certainly would like them to be here and really to see complementary aspects. And that's the, uh, the core value of this uh, uh, interactions with Purdue, our collaboration with Purdue. Thank you. You know, my mom spent 31 years managing production in a clean room wow. uh, at a biomedical company. It was hard work, but I thought it was the coolest thing when I was a kid because we got to get dressed up. So hopefully the students think so too. Another question. Patrick. Uh, Ambassador, welcome uh, to Purdue. Uh, Patrick Wilson uh, with MediaTek. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, Dr. Lin, uh, welcome back to Purdue. Uh, so I'm going to ask a proprietary question. You know, we're a chip design company, and we're all looking, uh, Dr. Lin, at what the future holds for artificial intelligence and chip design, right? Which is very, I know at your university and here at Purdue, we're looking at unpacking all of that. I wonder if you have some thoughts about the many young people who are here about how they're going to leverage artificial intelligence to design the chips of the future. Yeah, uh, well, in, in Taiwan, we think uh, what we are pushing, uh, what we call uh, a knowledge grounded uh, uh, concept or modeling. And this is what the, uh, the, 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 the directions of AI development uh, in this area, in this disciplines. And uh, so, you know, we, we think it is very important that right now the AI calculation seems to be depends on uh, putting things together onto the crowd. But the chip enable AI uh, locally uh, do it even on the uh, tip of the instrument. For example, we have a project which is uh, developing surgical equipment. So the idea is have the AI build an individual piece of the uh, surgical uh, instrument. And instead of just putting things all the way into the, uh, the crowd and do the calculation, not rely too much on the uh, communication and load it a lot on the uh, on that side. So uh, you know, from media tech, right? So chip design is certainly very important on those aspects. And uh, the right now our weak point, Taiwan's weak point on semiconductor is the chip design, the software. This is something that uh, we really want to, you know. Uh, go abroad and uh, working together with our partners to really strengthen uh, that part of the development, yeah. All right, um, Heidi. Also former State Department. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your remarks today. Um, my question is mostly for Representative Xiao. Um, but first I want to mention that it was really, um, I guess, heartwarming to hear you talk about your experience as a student in the United States, um, Dr. Lin as well, and to also point out that we have 423 students from Taiwan here at Purdue, and we're very proud of all of them. I think some of them are probably here in the room today. Um, and that number has grown significantly from uh, 266 uh, 10 years ago. So we really hope that that number will grow even further. Um, and we've heard a little bit about, you know, the exciting new partnership with NYCU and, um, you know, my Office of Global Partnerships also helps to, to work on partnerships just like that. Um, so maybe pivoting back a little bit to the Kroc Institute, you know, the main host of today's event, um, I would just like to hear a little bit more, Representative Xiao, about you know, how you envision the, the work, you know, of advancing freedom and democracy through trusted technology that the Institute does, you know, potentially really elevating the position of Taiwan on a global scale. And where do you see that partnership going? 
Thank you. Well, I'm really glad to hear that um, you have a growing number of Taiwanese students here at Purdue. And this is a positive trend that is very rare. Um, the challenge is we have a, a very low birth rate in Taiwan and a shrinking youth population. And so most universities complain to me that their Taiwanese student population is actually shrinking. But you know, obviously, Purdue is becoming the new attraction. And, um, but I, I, I think, like you know, Dr. Lin's experience and his project here, the MOU with Purdue cooperation like this, I think it fosters, um, you know, more. It creates more platforms and opportunities uh, for these um, educational exchanges. And uh, I think it's you know the fact that there is um, the Kroc Institute for um, Tech and Diplomacy. You know that this is. This is a very important concept. You know, historically, you know, tech and diplomacy are two distinct fields. You know, when I applied for college, you know, I originally thought I would you know, do something in math and chemistry. Um, but then I got politicized in Ohio and <laughs> said goodbye to STEM and, you know, or I just wasn't smart enough to continue that. So I, you know, verged into a, a different, you know, career path. But, um, and the smart people like Keith can do both. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, the smart people are still in STEM. But, but, but I, I think, you know, by, by think, you know and, and I think this goes back to my earlier remark that, you know, the purpose of diplomacy is to um, resolve cross-border, cross-cultural, cross-society challenges and to, you know, advance our shared interests. And, um, and technology has so much to do with all of our interests ahead of us, whether they be resolving you know, employment issue, education issue, talent issue, um, quality of life issues, you know, and of course security challenges and you know, global client, you know, everything across the board. And, and so you know, by this, this, you know, this merger of you know, diplomacy and technology is you know, creating you know, new networks and ideas for internationalizing uh, solutions and for internationalizing innovation. Um, and, you know, and, and I think it's certainly very relevant to everything we are trying to do um, in Taiwan. But I also think it's not Taiwan specific. Um, although the presence, you know, it, it's a global project. It's certainly not Taiwan specific, but having the presence of, of you know, these uh, uh, projects between universities, but also the presence of, of many um, um, Taiwanese uh, university students here. But also, you know, we want to encourage more American university students to study in Taiwan. And it's really disproportional. You know, the last statistics I saw was, you know, there are a little over 20,000 Taiwanese students studying in the U.S. now, but only about three, 4,000 Americans studying in Taiwan. The majority of them studying language, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, uh, which is also very important. It's foundational. You know, the language aspect is foundational mm -hmm. to all other aspects of, of learning. But um, I think there's certainly room for, for expanding that. Um, learning goes both ways, and that's why I'm pleased to hear you will be uh, leading a group of students to Taiwan. I think these cross-cultural experiences have such an important impact on the youth of our society. You know, it broadens our, our understanding of how the world is functioning and how challenges affect us all. And, and um, so again, these opportunities of you know, um, you know, uh, bridging technology diplomacy, but also fostering those uh, international exchanges and projects um, like, like, like the MOU um, are, are so important. All right, we've got time for one more question. Yes, sir. A question to Ambassador Xiao. Mm -hmm. As I recall, uh, about 12 or 13 years ago, I, I'm the Emeta uh, board member for Taiwanese American Foundation. Mm -hmm. And you made a video speech for our 12, 250 young leaders. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I, uh, you talk about democracy and uh, freedom and value. With the time change, with the technology evolve, do you want to carry the mission for the second or third generation of Taiwanese American, whether it should be pursued, same technology 
and uh, what kind of message are for the young generation, whether they want to become the just uh, like uh, the Jason Wong or the Navy DA <laughs> or the Dr. Su in a, uh, AMD. Thank you. Well, thank you for remembering my presentation from 13 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, um, you know, I'm, I'm flattered that you remember that. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, in terms of messaging uh, to the next generations of, of young people, um, I think we all have that as a responsibility to, you know, in, encourage more innovation. And, um, you know, I, I just said, you know, all the, in, in Taiwan society, uh, during my generation, parents encouraged the smart kids to all go into STEM. Um, and maybe that's why our politics are a mess, because you know, <laughs> all the smart people are, are in STEM. But I, I think you know, every, every path has its values. And, and I think we're trying to contribute to society in a holistic way. And you know, in, you know, innovation's important in technology and the STEM areas, but it's also, you know, important in, in the humanities and social progress and, and so many other areas. And, and uh, so, you know, I, I, I encourage uh, more, you know, young people to, to look up to those um, public figures. Um, you, you mentioned Jansen Huang and, you know, he's, um, I think his tour to the night market got more, you know, likes, <laughs> attention in Taiwan than, you know, anything else, but, or anyone else, but, um, you know, and, and it's certainly, you know, a, every success story is an inspiration. But I think what's important in technology is also, you know, uh, acknowledge, and that's why go, going back to why I think Taiwanese people are uniquely pragmatic and also uh, innovative, because, you know, a lot of innovation comes out of, you know, failures, mistakes, and, you know, we try this, it doesn't work, but it's not yeah. the end of the day. You know, we'll find yeah. another way around it. And, and that's what creativity is a, a, about. It's creating, you know, the best solutions, constantly refining them. Um, and we, we need to foster a culture of um, flexibility. We need to adapt. Uh, we need a, to, to accommodate changing environments. And, you know, you mentioned 12, 13 years ago, our geostrategic circumstances are very, very different today. And the challenges have been multiplied. And therefore, the creativity must also be multiplied. And, and, but I have a lot of confidence in future generations, because you know, when I was at this you know, university age, a lot of the communications, technologies, the way people interacted you know, did, didn't exist. And I think there's just so much more information out there available for making the, the right choices and for uh, inspiring next generations. So um, you know, I, I think it's not just up to me, but up to you and up to everyone to continue to encourage um, the young people of, of our societies. Well, that's a really great place to leave it today in thinking about the next generation, future generations. Uh, and I think with transformational leaders like we have here on stage, with Chairman Kroc, Ambassador Shao, and Dr. Lin, uh, we have a right to be optimistic about it. So please join me in welcoming and, and thanking our panel here today. <laughs>